This is a homily for the third Sunday of Advent. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8 and verses 19 to 28. The third Sunday of Advent is known as Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete is the Latin word for rejoice. So amidst the more sombre mood of Advent, Gaudete Sunday bids us rejoice because the celebration of the birth of our Saviour is close at hand. Today we make our own the words of St. Paul to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. The Lord is near. And on this Sunday we light the rose-coloured candle of the Advent wreath, another symbol of joy. And this is one of only two Sundays of the year when the priests may wear rose-coloured vestments. The other Sunday is Laetare Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Lent. Here you can see Pope Francis wearing a rose-coloured chasuble. The beginning of any story and our first encounter with the characters who appear at the beginning of the story is usually important. Last Sunday, we heard the opening words of Mark's Gospel. This week, we listen to a section of the prologue to John's Gospel. The prologue functions like the overture to a classical opera. It sounds several notes that will resonate throughout the drama that is about to unfold. Both Mark and John introduce us to John the Baptist in the first chapter of their Gospels. In fact, all four Gospels agree that there is no Gospel story without John the Baptist at the beginning. Both Mark and John see in John the Baptist a fulfilment of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice that cries in the desert, prepare a way for the Lord. Scripture scholars tell us that the prophet Isaiah, living in the 8th century BC, wrote chapters 1 to 39, known as 1st Isaiah. Chapters 40 to 55 were written by an anonymous prophet whom Scripture scholars call 2nd Isaiah, and chapters 56 to 66 were written by another anonymous prophet known as 3rd Isaiah. John the Baptist is quoting from chapter 40 from 2nd Isaiah, which scripture scholars believe was written towards the end of the Babylonian exile. Jerusalem had fallen to the Babylonians in 586 BC, and thousands of Jews were taken into exile in Babylon. The temple is destroyed, and the southern kingdom of Judah is abolished, along with its monarchy. Everything that had social, political, and religious significance is now lost, and the exiles must surely have thought that God had abandoned them. To a distraught, wearied, exiled, and fragile people, Isaiah proclaims a word of comfort from God to his people. Then, in 539 BC, the Persians defeated the Babylonians. Cyrus, king of Persia, then allows the exiles to return home to Israel. This return from Babylon is seen as a reenactment of the original liberation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. So, John the Baptist identifies himself with this anonymous prophet of the 6th century BC, preparing the exiles for their return home. John must therefore have seen his own ministry as the preparation for another return from exile, for a new and greater exodus. Mark tells us that John the Baptist was in the desert, presumably the desert of Judea to the west of the Dead Sea, 
and that he baptised Jesus in the Jordan. John's Gospel gives us further information when he tells us that the events of today's Gospel happened at Bethany on the far side of the Jordan where John was baptising. This Bethany, just to the north of the Dead Sea, is known as Bethany beyond the Jordan, to distinguish it from the Bethany that is located just to the southeast of Jerusalem. This is a photograph that I took of the place that is traditionally identified as the site where John baptised. The wooden structure at the top protects the archaeological remains of an ancient Christian church built there. This is another photograph, but this time with some water at the site of the baptism. In the 6th century, a pilgrim by the name of Theodosius visited the site and wrote this account of his visit. At the place where my Lord was baptised is the church of St John the Baptist, which was constructed by the Emperor Anastasius. It stands on great vaults which are high enough for when the Jordan is in flood. Anastasius was emperor in Constantinople from 491 to 518 AD. A 12th century pilgrim, Abbot Daniel, wrote that the place where Christ was baptised is distant from the river Jordan as far as a man can throw a small stone. The River Jordan flows just on the other side of the bushes that you can see at the top of this photograph. It is the boundary between the countries of Jordan and the modern state of Israel. Pope Francis visited the site on May the 24th, 2014. The significance of John choosing a site on the eastern side of the Jordan, suggests that he saw his ministry as heralding a new exodus. After leaving slavery in Egypt and wandering in the desert for 40 years, the people crossed the river Jordan and entered the promised land. The story is told in the book of Joshua. The priests carried the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. As soon as the bearers of the ark reached the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the ark touched the waters, the upper waters stood still and formed a single mass over a great distance. The priests carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in mid-Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the whole nation had completed its crossing of the Jordan. Those baptised by John in the Jordan were dramatically reenacting what their ancestors had done some 1,500 years earlier. The prologue to John's Gospel sounds a note that will resonate throughout the Gospel. We're told that John came as a witness to speak for the light. He was not the light, only a witness to speak for the light. The Gospel text chosen for today's Gospel omits verses 9 to 18. In those omitted verses, John tells us that the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And later in chapter 3 we're told, though the light has come into the world, people have shown that they prefer darkness to the light. A pervasive motif in John's Gospel is that of light versus darkness. It is a conflict that will run throughout the story. Darkness functions as the symbol of human rejection. In chapter 7, the evangelist tells us that the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near. Tabernacles is also known by its Hebrew name Sukkot, or by other names such as booths, shelters, huts, or tents. John uses this Jewish festival as a backdrop to an important episode in the Gospel. So what aspect of Sukkot, or tabernacles, is John using as a backdrop? 
Here you can see the courtyard of the women in the Jerusalem temple. Notice the four large lampstands. The Mishnah describes the lighting of these lampstands at the close of the first day of the festival of tabernacles. And the Mishnah tells us that these lampstands produced so much light that there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that did not reflect the light. Against the backdrop of this light shining upon the city, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. No follower of mine shall ever walk in darkness, but will possess the light of life. Jesus is the true light which enlightens everyone. He is the light of the world. In chapter 21, following the death and resurrection of the Lord, the disciples have returned to Galilee. It is night time, and Simon Peter decides to go fishing. Six of the disciples join him. The disciples toil all night in the darkness, but they catch absolutely nothing. This is John's way of telling us that any venture undertaken in darkness will end in futility. Darkness in this context is a way of speaking about being alienated or cut off from God. At dawn, a figure appears on the shore of the lake. Note, it is dawn. We are now in the light. We know that this stranger on the shore is Jesus, but the disciples fail to recognize him. He calls out to them, Throw out your nets to starboard and you'll find something. The disciples lower their nets and to their utter amazement, they catch a huge haul of fish. In the darkness, their efforts are futile. Not so in the light of this new day. Here we have the ultimate victory of light over darkness. So we are introduced to John the Baptist, but John quietly points away from himself and towards someone else. He comes as a witness for the one who is the light of the world. We're then told that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John a number of questions. The questions they put to John remind me of a verse from T.S. Eliot's play, The Rock. O my soul, be prepared for the coming of the stranger. Be prepared for him who knows how to ask questions. And the Gospels pose quite a number of questions. If you were to go through the Gospels slowly and carefully and count up all of the questions that are asked, you'd find that there are more than 200 questions. And some of those questions should make us feel quite uncomfortable. They should challenge, disturb and unsettle us. And speaking about unsettling questions, I recently read a magazine article entitled 10 Uncomfortable Questions. Here's the first question. Do you want the good news or the bad news first? Question number two was, will you promise not to get mad if I tell you something? Number three, you don't honestly expect me to believe that, do you? Number four, have you got any proof Number five, you don't remember me, do you? Number six, now what's the matter? Number seven, have you been waiting long? Number eight, don't you have a sense of humour? Number nine, are you asleep? And number ten, do you think I've put on weight? Well, in today's Gospel, priests and Levites from Jerusalem are sent to challenge John the Baptist with some uncomfortable questions. Who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? What have you to say about yourself? 
Why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ and you're not Elijah and you're not the prophet that Moses had promised? What they're essentially asking is, who are you and why are you doing what you're doing? Most of us spend a lifetime grappling with those fundamental questions that were put to John. Who am I? And why am I doing what I'm doing? The following letter was written in 1970 to the editor of The Times by Mrs. Valerie Elliott on the occasion of the death of Bertrand Russell at the age of 97. Her husband, T.S. Eliot, had died in 1965. Sir, my husband T.S. Eliot loved to recount how late one evening he stopped a taxi. As he got in, the driver said, You're T.S. Eliot! When asked how he knew, he replied, Ah, I've got an eye for a celebrity. Only the other evening I picked up Bertrand Russell, and I said to him, Well, Lord Russell, what's it all about? And do you know, he couldn't tell me. Yours faithfully, Valerie Elliott. Do we find ourselves smiling at the predicament of one of the great philosophers and mathematicians of the 20th century, seemingly perplexed and floundering, when asked the most simple yet profound question a human being can pose? Or are we more amused at the casual impudence of a taxi driver who expected a brief and concise answer while dispensing the change? In as few words as possible, he seems to be saying, give me a capsule answer to the meaning of life. As author Lisa Crone puts it, the human brain is a meaning-seeking machine. Rather than taking everything at face value, we're wired to try to figure out what's really going on. Because understanding the why fundamentally changes our perception of the what. The author, Robert Fulham, writes books with catchy titles. All I really need to know I learned in kindergarten. Uh Uh-oh! And what on earth have I done? But the title of another of his books comes from a story that he tells about a small-town emergency squad that was summoned to an apartment block where smoke was pouring out from an upstairs window. The fire crew broke into the apartment and found a man lying on a smouldering mattress. After the man was rescued and the burning mattress was dust, the obvious question was asked, How did this happen? I don't know, the man replied. It was on fire when I lay down on it. And that's the title of the book. If the story is at all amusing, it is surely because of the total absurdity of the man's response. Why would anyone knowingly lie down on a smouldering mattress? Were they suicidal, blind, on drugs, drunk or psychotic? We instinctively seek an explanation for such bizarre behaviour. What does it mean? In his novel, The Power of One, Bryce Courtney tells an amusing story about our quest for meaning. It's a story about a cobbler who lives in a Jewish village in Russia. As he spreads honey on a piece of bread, it accidentally falls onto the floor. To his amazement, the bread landed on the floor, the honeyed side up. How can this be? he asked, and with the slice of bread still in his hand, he ran to consult the rabbi and the village elders. We are Jews in Russia. How can it be that I spread honey on my bread, and when it fell to the floor, it landed the right side up? Since when did luck such as this come to a Jew? The rabbis and the elders pondered the point for several days, 
consulting the Torah and the Mishnah frequently. Finally, they call the cobbler into the synagogue. The rabbi pronounced the verdict. The answer, my boy, is quite clear. You honeyed your bread on the wrong side. As human beings, we're hardwired to seek meaning, to ask why. Maybe the most important advice to people who are searching is the answer that the poet Reina Maria Rilke gave to the young man who asked him if he should become a poet. Rilke told him this, You ask whether your verses are good. You ask me. You have asked others before. You send them to magazines. You compare them with other poems. And you are disturbed when certain editors reject your efforts. Now, I beg you to give up all that. You are looking outward, and that, above all, you should not do now. Nobody can counsel and help you. Nobody. There is only one single way. Go into yourself. Search for the reason that bids you to write. Find out whether it is spreading out its roots in the deepest places of your heart. Acknowledge to yourself whether you would have to die if it were denied you to write. This above all, ask yourself in the stillest hour of your night. Must I write? Delve into yourself for a deep answer. And if this should be affirmative, if you may meet this earnest question with a strong and simple, I must, then build your life according to this necessity. Your life, even into its most indifferent and slightest hour, must be a sign of this urge and a testimony to it. At some stage in life, we all wrestle with this basic question. Not a question about whether or not our verses are good, but about the meaning and direction of our lives. Who am I? And why am I doing what I am doing? But are we patient enough to delve into ourselves, into the deepest places of our heart, and truly listen? As Henry Nguyen points out, this is a very difficult task because in our world we are constantly pulled away from our innermost self and encouraged to look for answers instead of listening to the questions. In this holy season of Advent, let us allow the questions put to John the Baptist to resonate within our own lives. Who are you? What have you to say about yourself? Why are you doing what you are doing? These are what have been called redemptive questions. Questions that seek to trigger a definitive awakening. <laughs>